pleased to welcome you here to Salem State University. I'm Pat McGuire Missouri, and I have the distinct privilege of being the president of our public university of the North Shore and delighted to welcome you to our ever-growing campus. I hope our construction wasn't too much of an obstacle as you were trying to weave your way into campus. That building out there that you're seeing take shape will be our new Viking Hall, which will be a residence hall for an additional 350 students here at, at Salem State University. And the rubble that you saw across the street as you were coming in will be a parking lot to replace the space that we're taking up with the residence hall. <clears throat> but very pleased to be able to host this forum today on the very important issue of payment reform in Massachusetts and looking at the, uh, the many changes that are occurring within healthcare delivery, healthcare um, payment mechanisms, and the um, opportunities and challenges that presents to all of us. As a public university, we feel it is very important that we share our resources with the greater community and find opportunities to host events such as this. And we're so very fortunate to have wonderful partners that, um, that are able to work with us. And in this instance, I do need to uh, highly recognize the North Shore WIB. Mary Saris, as the executive director of the WIB, is the one who initiated um, having this forum come together and really appreciate the work of the WIB. Certainly, the Commonwealth Corporation, and we'll have Nancy speak in just a moment, has always been a, a wonderful partner. And I'm pleased to introduce to people, you'll meet her in a, in a bit, but Pat Gentile is the new president of North Shore Community College, our sister institution, and very pleased that uh, Pat is partnering here as well. I look forward to hearing the comments of our uh, panelists with Bob Norton and Dennis Conroy. We're delighted to have the expertise of our major health facilities, our major hospitals on the North Shore join us today, and we'll look forward to the perspectives that will come from, from both of you, so thank you for being here. And very much look forward to Jessica uh, LaRoche's uh, comments from Blue Cross Blue Shield. She has been making the presentation in different parts of the state, and I think will give us a good perspective on why Massachusetts is as costly as it is in healthcare, but also, again, opportunities that will come from some of, some of the reforms. So again, thank you all for being here today. We welcome you to Salem State and hope you will come back often. And with that, I'm going to, oh, uh, well, let me just do two introductions if I could. We have a couple, uh, an individual who is running for the 13th um, Essex seat in the State House. That's Tom Lyons. Tom, would you just like to say hello? And very pleased that um, Sam Gamer from Senator Joan Lovely's office has joined us as well. Sam, can you hear? Sam, great. Thank you both for being here today. We appreciate it. And I'd like to introduce to you now Nancy Snyder, president of the Commonwealth Corporation. Uh, thank you, President Mazurvi, and for both your welcoming remarks and for host hosting today's event. I'd also like to thank uh, Karen Schack from Commonwealth Corporation and Mary Saris and her team at the North Shore Workforce Board for organizing today's event. We have some great speakers who you're going to hear from uh, uh, shortly, so, so I'll be brief. Um, this is the third event that we've done with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation. They've been very generous with their time. Uh, as all, I think, as probably everyone here knows, Chapter 224 um, created some uh, new uh, requirements, incentives around uh, payment reform that we know is going to have some impact on how we deliver healthcare services, which in turn is going to have some impact on workforce. Um, what's the training that we need for the incumbent workforce? What's the training that we might need for a pipeline of new workers in workforce development? And so we've really organized these events to try to understand that, both from the perspective um, of, of Jessica's expertise around the law and from the perspective of, uh, of um, local health care providers um, who are really on the ground implementing this. One of the funds that was created by Chapter 224 is the Health Care Workforce Transformation Fund that's overseen by the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development, administered by Commonwealth Corporation, and there's also an advisory committee um, of people from the field uh, who are very actively engaged in how this, uh, how this particular uh, fund works. And I want to give a brief update around what we've done uh, with the fund to date. Uh, in April, we awarded nearly $2 million 
uh, to about 51 organizations uh, to do planning, which is really sort of evaluation and assessment around what their training priorities were relative to implementation of Chapter 224 and putting together um, a training plan uh, that they would then implement in, this, in the second phase uh, of, the, of the Workforce Transformation Fund. The 51 grantees have been doing some really interesting work. Karen and her team have been um, really working hard to try to, br to bring together some, in a short period of time, because it was a four-month project, some kind of learning communities and ways to share best practices. And we've seen representation really from every subsector of healthcare working on a wide range of issues in the planning grants. The second phase of this are training grants. Uh, we posted a request for proposal on March 5th uh, for training grants. Letters of intent to bid were due on June 27th. The actual training uh, proposals are due on July 31st. We received over 100 letters of intent to bid, so I think we're, it's gonna be, there's gonna be some really great projects. Um, in there, um, we will be awarding those uh, in the fall, and again, we'll really try to emphasize ways in which we can both share learning across the training projects, but also share learning with the broader healthcare and education community so that we're able to really try to understand what are the trends around healthcare workforce needs. So today we're gonna hear from Jessica Larachelle from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation who's gonna provide us with an overview of Chapter 224 and its potential impact on workforce needs in healthcare. Jessica is the Director of Evaluation and Strategic Initiatives at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Found of Massachusetts Foundation. She oversees evaluation at the foundation and works on affordability and cost containment initiatives that span both the grant making and policy arms of the foundation. Most recently, Jessica served as field, directors, field director at Families USA and has extensive experience working with consumer health advocates across the nation. I encourage you to look at the back of the program for Jessica's full bio. Jessica has been very generous with her time in preparing and presenting this overview of Chapter 224. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Larachelle. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank Commonwealth Corporation, both Nancy and Karen, as well as Salem State University, the North Shore Workforce Investment Board, North Shore Community College, and the North Shore Career Center for inviting me to be here this morning. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here with you all and talk about this topic, evolution in healthcare delivery and payment reform, and what that means for the healthcare workforce. Obviously, it's a very, very hot topic. This is in the news all the time. It affects all of our professional lives, which is why we're here this morning, but it also affects all of us as patients and family members. So it's very, very meaningful for all of us on multiple levels. When Karen and Nancy invited me to be here this morning, they sent me the registration list. And I think probably the most exciting thing about this morning is you all. There is an incredible amount of expertise and experience in the room. And it's also very diverse. So during my presentation, I'm actually going to pause at two different points for Q&A, and I'll do my best to answer your questions, but I also welcome at this time for you to share your insight and for you to share your experience and for us to really have a full discussion and to learn from one another. So over the course of the next hour, I'm first going to talk about why. Why is this all happening? What are the forces that are driving payment and delivery system reform in healthcare? And then we're gonna get concrete. We're gonna talk about what is actually happening here in Massachusetts and around the country. At that point, we're gonna break for Q&A, have a discussion, and then we're gonna go back. And we're gonna take that and we're gonna apply it to what we're seeing in the healthcare workforce. And then at the end, I'm gonna go back to a new law called Chapter 224 and talk about some funding streams. Nancy already referred to the Healthcare Workforce Transformation Fund and I'm going to talk about that one and some other ones as potential sources of revenue to help us to get from here to there. All right? So with that, let's get started. So why is healthcare spending so high in Massachusetts? Massachusetts actually has the highest per person healthcare spending in the world. Massachusetts, I'll say it again, has the highest per person healthcare spending 
in the entire world. That's incredible when you think about it. So why? Why is it so costly? Why is healthcare cost spending so high here in our state? Well, when we think about healthcare spending and healthcare costs, we typically think about it in four different areas. The first one is utilization. And that generally refers to us, the consumers. Who's utilizing healthcare services in Massachusetts? And in general, in Massachusetts, we as a population, we tend to be older, we tend to be wealthier, and we're more likely to be insured. We're more likely to have health insurance coverage. And all of these aspects are positive predictors of healthcare use. So the first thing is healthcare utilization. The second thing is provider mix. So what kinds of healthcare providers do we have in Massachusetts? We actually have the highest density of specialists per 100,000 population in Massachusetts. And care that's provided by specialists, even when it's the same kind of care, it tends to be more expensive. So our, our provider mix is intense in Massachusetts. Service mix refers to the kind of care, the kinds of treatment, the kinds of tests that we get in Massachusetts. And we have a lot of specialists, we have a lot of academic medical centers, and our, our, the intensity of our services tends to be higher in this state than in other states and in other parts of the world. And to give you a concrete example, that might mean that someone in Massachusetts, if they were injured, might be more likely to get an MRI or a CT scan than an X-ray. That's an example of a higher intensity of service. But the number one reason, the number one reason why healthcare costs are so high in Massachusetts is prices. The prices for healthcare services are really high in Massachusetts. And not only are they high, there's incredible disparities in healthcare prices across the state. And at some of the highest paid providers, their prices can be 10 times higher than some of the lowest paid providers in our state. A great example is a knee replacement surgery. At some of the highest paid providers, a knee replacement surgery costs $25,000. And at some of the lowest paid providers, they it costs $14,000 for the exact same procedure. And we know that higher costs doesn't always mean higher quality. So price is the number one factor why healthcare costs are so high in Massachusetts. So now that we have a sense of why costs are so high, what are we doing about it? Well, in 2012, the state passed Chapter 224. And this is a law that's one in a series of laws, it's the latest law, that attempts to rein in healthcare cost growth in our state. And something that this law does that's very innovative and very unique is it sets a benchmark or a target for healthcare cost growth. And in 2013 and 2014, the benchmark was 3.6%, which is about the same as growth in the economy. So what does is, what is 3.6% mean? That's actually, it's actually pretty aggressive. If you ask healthcare economists, they would say between 2012 and 2021, that healthcare spending would grow on average 1.5% faster than the economy. And 3.6 is about the economy. So to achieve the 3.6% benchmark, that's tough. That's gonna be a challenge. And the law itself, it's, it's not prescriptive. Sets this benchmark, puts it out there, and basically it tracks and makes public how hospitals and provider groups and health plans are doing against this target but it doesn't tell anybody how to achieve it. It does establish some building blocks, like the ones listed on the slide, and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the primary care workforce later. But in general, it allows market forces to figure out how to meet this 3.6% benchmark for 2013, 2014, and then the benchmark will get adjusted beyond. The one area where it is prescriptive is it requires that the environment shift towards something called alternative payment methodologies. That is the one area where it is prescriptive. So what do we mean when we say alternative payment methodologies? Alternative payment methodologies is basically just a fancy way of saying changing the way we pay and deliver healthcare. Pay, changing the way that we pay for healthcare. So under the current system, which is the, 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 slide, the part of the slide on the left, 
hospitals, doctors, and other healthcare providers get paid every time they provide a service. So every time they see a patient, every time a, a patient gets a test, every time a patient gets a procedure, they get paid. So the reward is for volume. So the, the more you do, right, the more money you get. So it's just natural, the incentive is to do more. And if you also look at the slide, you'll notice that the different parts, the different providers in the healthcare system are operating in silos. You get paid for the services that you provide for within the walls of your institution. And there's not a lot of incentive to coordinate or talk to other entities. So in 2009, a special commission, commission on payment systems was created, and they recommend, recommended that we move away from the, the current fee-for-service payment system, the left side of the slide, to the right side of the slide, which is what we call more of a global payment system. And the way that's different is it has different kinds of health care providers. So your, your primary care providers, your hospitalists, your specialists, your home health care, um, form new agencies and align. So everyone is coordinated and folks have the same incentives. And instead of getting paid by volume for individual services, you get a global budget. The special commission is recommended moving toward these global budgets. And we'll talk more in detail about these in a minute. So instead of getting the incentive getting paid to do more and more, your incentive is now to operate within a budget and for everyone to talk to one another and coordinate with each other. So it's not, won't be any more about providing more care, it's now about providing the right care to control costs and to improve health care quality. And this has tremendous implications for the workforce. It has implications about the types of workers, the skills that the workers have, where care is delivered, when care is offered, and how it's delivered. All right, so we're gonna talk through some concepts in payment and delivery system reform to, to make these theories more concrete. And these are all drawing mostly from the, afford the Federal Affordable Care Act as well as um, the state's Chapter 224 cost containment law. So the first one is accountable care organizations or ACOs. So the definition is an organization that takes on the responsibility for providing care for a defined population of patients with a goal of one, improving quality, and two, reducing costs. So let's dissect this a little bit. When we talk about an organization, that essentially means a collection of healthcare providers. And with an ACO, an accountable care organization, you always have to have a primary care provider. That's the keystone of accountable care organization. You always have to have an accountable care provider as one of those types of providers. And then all ACOs look very different. You can have other kinds of providers like physician groups, hospitals, specialists, post-acute care providers. And in some cases, and these are unusual cases, you'll also have institutions like Walgreens, you also might have insurance companies, and you also might have community-based organizations that provide more social supports like housing and food. But the point is, no matter who is involved in the ACO, it's always a primary care provider plus other institutions these groups, this new organization, these pro different provider entities come together, form one new provider organization, and they take on a joint responsibility for caring for and improving the health of a population of patient patients. And there's common features with ACOs. They're all responsible for meeting certain cost benchmarks. And they usually do this by avoiding duplication in services across the different institutions and trying to have less unnecessary tests and procedures. They also have quality benchmarks that they have in common. And they usually achieve quality benchmarks by focusing on prevention and focusing on um, care management, especially for people with the most complex health care conditions. So key elements. Coordinating care to reduce duplication, strong focus on health information technology, redesigning care pro processes, and adherence to evidence-based practices. Just because the evidence-based practices exist doesn't necessarily mean that they're being implemented. 
So translating those into practice. So show of hands, how many people here know if they're getting care through an accountable care organization? Okay. So there's about, studies show that about 14% of the population in the U.S. is already getting their care through um, an ACO model. So these are relatively new models, but they're taking off. So to make this more local, um, there are some kinds of edit, um, ACOs, accountable care organizations, that um, are modeled through the federal government. And there's one called a Medicare Pioneer ACO. There's 23 of them across the country, five are here in Massachusetts, and I know Partners has penetration up here on the North Shore, and Partners is one of the Medicare Pioneer ACOs. Um, there's another kind of a ACO called Medicare Share Savings. There are 220 of them across the country, 13 are here in Massachusetts, and they include Winchester Community ACO, Leahy Clinical Performance ACO, and Circle Health Alliance and Lowell. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, different kinds of payment reform. And I'm gonna spend the most time talking about global payments and global budgets, building on what we talked about in that, that slide with the, um, with the silos and then the big bucket. So the way global payments work, if you're an ACO, you can accept a lot of different kinds of payment contracts. But, um, but the move is to, the, the trend is to move um, um, folks into global payments as kind of the, the most aggressive means to reform. So again, a group of healthcare providers comes together with a payer and they set up a contract. And the first basis of a, of a contract in a global payment system is that global budget. And so it's a budget to care for a defined population over a fixed period of time. So the first thing is we wanna make sure that nobody's cherry picking, right? That people are taking care of everybody. So sometimes the budgets are risk adjusted, meaning that if the population is generally older and sicker, your budget's gonna be a little bit bigger. And if your population's younger and healthier, it might be a little bit smaller. But the providers and the payers work together and they come up with a budget. And then, on the cost side, so this, remember the first benchmark of these cost benchmarks, there's a carrot and a stick approach to controlling costs. And um, some contracts just have the carrot feature, some contracts have the carrot and the stick, the stick feature, um, but I'm gonna go over, over both concepts. So let's do the stick first. I'm gonna make this up. Say the budget they agree on is $100,000 per year. All right, I'm just making this up. So the provider organization, the group of providers, works on providing care over the course of a year, and they're not able to do it for $100,000. They blow the budget. They spend $120,000. Well, when there's risk involved, that provider and the payer, the, the insurer, are both on the line for the $20,000. And that's a, that's a large percentage of that budget. So that's, that's a significant incentive to try to, to try to meet the original budget. But it can also go the other way, right? The provider group working together can provide the care over the course of a year. Maybe they do it for $80,000, right? Maybe there's $20,000 of their budget. They, they do it in a really efficient way. Well, with the, the carrot approach, both the group of providers and the payer stand to share in these savings. So there's incentive on the other side too. And that's actually incredibly interesting for a workforce um, for this reason. When savings come in, the group of providers can use that saving any way they want to. And they can also use it for things that are not currently paid for or reimbursed under the current fee-for-service system but might have really big implications in terms of improving quality and reducing costs. So some of the things I'm talking about are patient education, care coordination, some kinds of care management, the use of community health workers. These are all kinds of services and roles that have the potential to better manage the health of this population, but there aren't necessarily codes for them in the current fee-for-service system. But under this new payment methodology, 
if they're savings, and they're if these flexible dollars, if you will, healthcare, these healthcare provider organizations, there's more room for experimentation and investment in new areas, and in areas that are not paid for right now, that have the potential to increase quality and reduce cost. So it's definitely something um, to keep in mind. And then the last part of a global payment is there's quality benchmarks. So we want to make sure that in meeting this budget, we're not skimping on care, right? We're not denying anybody good care or good services. So the group of providers and the payer negotiate quality benchmarks. And they could be around patient access, they could be around preventive care, they could be around care management, they could be around infrastructure. But by setting these quality benchmarks and having incentive payments for the quality benchmarks, we make sure that we're not skimping on care. I'm going to go through quickly through bundled and episode-based payments and value-based purchasing. But es essentially, the, the bundled and episode-based, is it's similar. It also works within a, a, a budget. And value-based purchasing is, is, um, is basically it's, it's paying for performance or it's paying based on some kind of um, accountability measure. But the, the point of all of these new kinds of payment reform is that there's, there's a halt to paying for more. There's a halt to paying for volume. And there are these new incentives to keep people healthy and to drive down costs and to keep people unnecessarily out of intensive acute care settings and delivering more primary preventive care. Okay. And now I'm going to talk through a couple of concepts that are also very important to the workforce that are happening here in Massachusetts and in other states. So the first thing is called a patient-centered medical home. And that basically, it's a primary care practice that has an augmented ability to care for patients within its own walls and to coordinate with specialists and hospitals in its community. So what does augmented mean? Well, it basically means it's a redesigned primary care. It's a smarter primary care. It's a more innovative care, primary care. And that could mean working in multidisciplinary teams. It could mean care coordination across different settings. It could mean care management for your sickest patients. It could mean educating patients and providing them with self-management tools to help them manage their own chronic conditions. Helping patients set goals and helping patients develop action plans. If there are evidence-based evidence practices, making sure that they're actually employed or used within the walls of your institution. And generally, enhance access. If a patient is sick, it doesn't necessarily happen during business hours, right? Most of the time, I, in my family, it doesn't. So after hours, weekends, phone, email. So it's, it's, it's kind of the new world of primary care. Now, the Medicaid program in Massachusetts, the program that's established to take care of people with lower incomes, um, has come up with a new pilot called the Primary Care Payment Reform Initiative. And essentially what this does is it strives to integrate this new patient-centered medical home model with behavioral health care. So it aims to move the integration of physical and behavioral health care forward. And it, it works on a global budget. But when you think about the integration of physical health and behavioral health care, there's, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. On one end of the spectrum, primary care and behavioral health care, they could just communicate with one another. They could just make referrals. Kind of in the middle, they could be co-located. They could be in the same building. And on this end of the spectrum, they could be completely integrated, where behavioral health specialists and primary care practitioners are all on the same team. They're seeing the same patients. They're developing the same care plan. They're sharing medical records, and they're thinking of the patient as a whole person. And in the primary care payment reform initiative, they also have the budget concept that we talked about. But the further you are along the continuum, the more integrated you are, the greater your budget. So there's an incentive with this program to really move forward and push the integration of the physical and behavioral health services. And the last initiative that I want to talk about, which is really exciting, is called One Care. And this is a program in Massachusetts and, and a handful of other states for people with disabilities under 65 years of age. And um, they receive, in the past, they received um, health insurance coverage from the Medicaid program. 
so coverage for people of low income. And the Medicare program covers for coverage for seniors and people with disabilities. And if your care is getting paid for by two different payers, the payment is often fragmented and complex, and so is the care delivery. So this attempts to bring it all together and provide more coordinated, more seamless, more appropriate, higher quality, lower cost care for people with disabilities under 65. Now, a central tenant of this is a position called a care coordinator, which is something that's, we've mentioned this a couple times already, and it'll keep coming up again in my presentation. Every person that's a part of one of these one care plans, every person with a disability under 65 who's participating in this program, gets assigned a care coordinator. And they work with the patient to develop, to develop a personal care plan. And they also help coordinate all of the patient's primary care, behavioral health care, and long-term services and support care. One care plans also cover non-traditional services, services that aren't traditionally covered in, um, in general health plans, including peer support, wellness support, medical equipment repair, home modifications, respite care, and transportation. And they also cover the position of a community health worker, which is very unusual, but very interesting for the workforce and something that we'll come back to again later. All right, so what does this all mean? We talked about why healthcare costs are too high. We talked about ACOs, accountable care organizations, global payments, patient-centered medical homes, the primary care payment reform initiative at the Medicaid office, the One Care program. Well, I think there are some important takeaways. The first thing to know is that these things are taking off. They're exploding. So if you look at the commercial side, Blue Cross Blue Shield has a global payment contract program. It's called the Alternative Quality Contract. Started in 2009. By 2012, 70% of its HMO membership was part of this global payment arrangement. Similarly, it's Tufts. In 2012, about 70% of their membership was also part of global payments. And if you look at the public side, Chapter 224, the cost containment law, mandates that by 2015, 80% of Medicaid enrollees be involved in some kind of alternative payment contract or arrangement. So this is here, and it's moving very quickly. So then the next question I think to ask, and maybe this is my bias as an uh, evaluation officer, well, is it working, right? And I think the answer to that is, it's, it's very early, right? These laws just passed. So there isn't conclusive data, and I can tell you as an evaluation person that it takes time to show outcomes, but I also can tell you that some of the early results are very promising. And in fact, um, the, alternative quality, the alternative quality contract at Blue Cross um, was analyzed by the company in Harvard Medical School. And it did show better performance for the folks that were part of the global payment arrangement on quality indicators and showed promise of lower cost growth than a similar group of folks in a fee-for-service payment arrangement. So with anything, I think there are, um, there are skeptics and there are champions, right? So the skeptics would say, well, as we move towards accountable care organizations, and, um, and these global payment arrangements, providers are gonna wanna consolidate, and they're gonna wanna form mergers, and they're gonna get bigger and bigger, and that's gonna increase market power, and that's gonna increase prices, and that's not gonna help with healthcare costs, if you remember from the first slide. So those are the skeptics. On the other side, the champions and the optimists would say, well, this model has incentives in place, very clear incentives, to decrease costs, to increase quality, and there's some really early promising evidence. And because of that, there's a lot of reason for optimism. So with that, I'm gonna pause and take about five to 10 minutes of questions and we'll have a discussion and then we'll move on to the second part of the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so it's, um, it's through the MassHealth, the, the Medicaid program in the state, and Medicaid is a joint partnership between the state and the federal government. Um, and I, I know that usually when MassHealth does a new program, they have to get permission from the feds, they have to get a special waiver. Um, so I can't definitively say if it's just federal dollars or a combination of state and federal, um, 
but I, I'm not positive through a waiver, but, but I usually when MassHealth does a, um, a, an initiative, there has to be some kind of federal approval process. No, there's no finding yet. I think it's, I believe it's very new. Um, does anyone else in the audience have more information on primary care payment reform initiative? So I, I know that they released a bid and um, practices who are interested could apply. And, um, and practices um, applied. But I, I think it's still very new. So this is essentially the um, patient-centered medical home initiative through MassHealth is terminated on um, March 31st, and they were trying to get everyone to roll in to the primary care payment reform initiative. Is there a I don't know. I hope so. That's that's um, that's something else you'd have to find out from Mass Health. I'm sorry, I don't know. So does anyone else have any more information in the room about the Mass Health program? How will this affect people that are already retired? Well, if you're already retired. That's a great question. Um, there's actually, I would think that the biggest effect for people who are already retired, so assuming that you're retiring when you're over 65 years of age. And some of the first um, accountable care organizations came out of the Affordable Care Act, which was a, a federal law. And those were through the Medicare program. And folks who are retired are going to be more likely to be on Medicare. So they would be likely to be part of the pioneer of those Medicare shared savings ACOs. So, um, so the Medicare program, which is gonna encompass a lot of people retirement age, is moving very quickly on the accountable care organization front. Yeah. They aren't on Medicare. People who retire, so usually state employees get their insurance for something called the GIC, the, the Group Insurance Commission, and, um, and they would probably have a different payment arrangement. But that being said, if Chapter 224, I know the provision in Chapter 224 requires 80% of Mass Health members, Medicaid members, to go into alternative payment methodologies by 2015. And it also encourages all payers to the maximum extent possible, that's the language in the law, to move away from fee-for-service into alternative payment methodology. So I, I can't speak specifically as to what the GIC, the Group Insurance Commission, is doing, but I would be shocked if they're not having some kind of planning process or negotiations or, or movement. Mm -hmm. You guys have a great question. Yeah. There isn't a, I, I don't think um, the, the theory is that people will actually use healthcare less. I think the thinking is that they're just going to maybe use um, different kinds of healthcare. So, um, say for me as a patient, I think some of the savings would come from um, preventive care and care management and trying to keep me healthy in the first place and avoiding the unnecessary, very expensive specialist care, right? So it's kind of a, a shift, if you will. So the amount of my primary care spending might go way up, but if it's effective, if you can keep me out of the, the hospital and some specialty care settings, those are your bigger ticket items. Those are the ones that are going to come down. Or some, sometimes people, you know, people get sick, right? Everybody gets sick. Healthcare, health is an incredible equalizer. Um, people go in the hospital. So can we deliver care more efficiently in the hospital? Can there be more efficiencies in, in the inpatient and the acute care settings? And then once you're discharged, and this is a huge area of evolution in healthcare delivery, how can there be better transitions from these acute care settings to post-acute settings and then to community settings 
to help people um, not be unnecessarily readmitted. So I, I don't know if it's um, that you're actually going to be seeing doctors less. It's just hopefully a, a shift in the kinds of services. And even in primary care, it might be you're getting more education, you're getting more, a better understanding how to manage your disease. And it, it, this is going out on a limb. If you think about the health of a whole person, sometimes the folks who have the most complex needs, it's just as much about their food and their housing and maybe it's better connections to social support. So it's a, it's a redesign, if you will. Mm. Yes. I can't speak specifically to Blue Cross um, because the, the foundation is actually separate than the insurance company. So I actually don't know anything more about Blue Cross as I do about Medicaid, as I do about POPs per se. But risk adjustment, yeah. Um, risk adjustment's a tricky thing and it's a controversial thing. Um, and it is, um, there, there are certain ways that I think are more accepted for risk adjustment. Um, um, health status, previous health claims, things like that. And then I do know that risk adjustment gets trickier when you think about behavioral health and when you think about socioeconomic status. But I'm, I'm not an expert to know, I don't know anything more with that in terms of the exact risk adjustment formulas. But I, I do know the principle, the theory is that you want to create an incentive where everyone is cared for in these budgets, right? And you don't want to dis disincentivize caring for the, the folks with the most complicated needs. And that's why there's a push to consider these other factors beyond what's included in traditional risk adjustment calculations, like socioeconomic status, like you said, um, behavioral health needs, which are very hard to measure and, and quantify um, when you're doing those calculations. So I'm sorry that's not more helpful, but that's as much as I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, that's a good question. I would say the accountable care organizations are extremely new. And in most of the models that are popping up, I don't think that you'll see chiropractic care. But that's not to say that there aren't non-traditional models out there. Remember I mentioned that sometimes there's a Walgreens, sometimes there's an insurance company that's part of it. Sometimes there's community-based supports, um, so it might be a, a housing authority, it might be a food pantry, it could be a, 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 an organization that provides chiropractic care. But it's, it's interesting, healthcare is, um, be, is more and more like a business, right? So if you were a chiropractic clinic in a community, and if there was an accountable care organization in your community, and if you thought that you could provide value to the population, you would have to go to the folks who are running the ACO, and you'd almost have to make a business case, right? That because these, this is how much your services cost, that because of them, you'd almost have to make a value proposition or show your return on investment. And so I think that's a lot of where, where that's headed. So to, to answer your question, I don't think we're seeing it yet, but, um, but there's a lot of room for innovation. All right, I'm gonna just back, I'll take one more question, and then I'm gonna go back, yeah, hi. interesting so it's almost like a moral hazard so are, as as folks with lower incomes because of the insurance expansions get coverage are we seeing more use in healthcare services because they now have the coverage yes so the to yeah i i don't know i'm not aware of it um we do have a the um kate nordle and caitlin kenny walsh in our policy department might be aware of it um economic theory would say yes Right, moral hazard, if you, if you have health insurance, you're more likely to get health care because cost is no longer a barrier. 
Um, but I don't know if, if the hard data exists. And that's actually a great research question, if someone hasn't done it already. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's jump back. Okay, so we talked about why healthcare costs are so high. We talked about um, different delivery and payment system evolutions. And now let's translate all this knowledge and think about what might it mean for the healthcare workforce. So there's changes in the way that healthcare is paid for, and that's gonna create some changes in the way healthcare is delivered as the incentives are changing. And we're gonna talk through shifts in demands for types of services, new skills and responsibilities demanded upon healthcare workforce, and also um, changes relative to three specific occupations that came out of Chapter 224 that are important to know about. All right, types of services. To understand shifts in types of services, it's important to understand this concept called the triple aim that came out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Because basically the goals of payment and delivery system reform are the same as the goals of the triple aim. So the first part is experience at the point of care. So it's quality at the point of care. So is the care that's being delivered, is it patient-centered? Is it being delivered through teams? Is it evidence-based? Are patients being educated and getting the tools that they need to manage their diseases? Population health, on the other side, basically thinks about health outcomes. And it moves beyond the interaction between the provider and the individual patient to thinking about the health of entire populations of patients. So an example of this might be um, a group of providers, an ACO, takes on responsibility for a population of patients. And perhaps they know that they have a large share of patients with diabetes. Well, they might implement a special program to take care of patients with diabetes, whereby they make sure that folks are regularly getting their hemoglobin A1C tested, that if they haven't come in for an appointment in a certain amount of time, they get a proactive call to come in and get their primary care, that there's good care coordination happening with eye doctors and with podiatrists. So it's, um, it's thinking about health beyond the individual of two populations, and it's thinking about improvements in health outcomes. And finally, per capita cost. So that's where we get into decreasing waste, decreasing inefficiencies, um, and decreasing unnecessary emergency department and inpatient hospitalizations. So essentially, what we're seeing in a nutshell, we started to talk about this during this Q&A, it's a move away from avoidable or unnecessary specialty and acute care towards an increased emphasis on primary care and prevention. But it's not primary care as we know it. It's this revamped, redesigned, innovative, smarter primary care, if you will, so that people are getting the right care when it's needed and in the most appropriate setting. All right, so what does this mean in terms of skills and responsibilities for the workforce? We're gonna talk through kind of four different dimensions. The first one is patient engagement. So what do we mean when we say an engaged patient? Is that a patient who shows up for their appointment? They're on time? They have a list of questions to ask their doctor or their other healthcare provider? And maybe they have a baggie with all their medicines? so that they can talk through what medicines they're taking. That's an engaged patient, right? It is that, but in this new world, it's also more than that. It's providers working with patients to set patient-specific goals. It's providers working with patients to set action plans, to do care planning, to make sure that patients have that disease self-management support and to make sure that care is delivered in a way that's patient and family-centric, that it, that it works for the folks who are ultimately receiving the services. So why is this important, right? Why, why would we care if, if patients are engaged? Well, there's a, there's a woman named Judith Hibbard who's actually done a lot of work in this area, as well as other researchers. And she's found that when patients are engaged, when they're active, when they have a great partnership with their providers, when they're involved in their healthcare decision making, those patients actually have better health outcomes. And there's also some evidence that they might even have lower healthcare spending. And when we're thinking about ACOs and these new payment models, these new payment models, it always comes back to the two benchmarks, quality and cost, and 
So there, that's it, there you go. So in terms of patient engagement skills, right? If you're, if you're working in healthcare, what, what does that mean? Well, you probably have to be pretty good at motivational interviewing. You'd probably have to be pretty good at healthcare coaching. And you'd have to be really good at helping patients set goals and helping develop patient-centered care plans. Now this isn't easy, right? It requires special training. It's tough already to find time in an appointment, but this is additional time. And you're gonna need good information systems to, to see where patients are at and to track them over time. But just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's worth doing. So patient engagement in a healthcare workforce that can really engage and partner with patients is the first new skill and responsibility that we're seeing. So um, patient engagement, right? In a healthcare workforce that, that can really work with the patient as a partner and engage that patient. It's, it's um, a different relationship, if you will, than the old model. That's kind of the first dimension or the first skill. Is it okay if I hold questions to the end? Okay, I promise I'll get to it, I'll save time. All right, the second one is team-based care. So in the traditional model, typically a physician sees a patient, they see individual patients, sometimes they have the help of a medical assistant. But in this new model, there's a whole multi multidisciplinary team-based approach. And we're talking about nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, medical assistants, but I also encourage all of you to think much broader. The foundation through its grant making has seen teams that include receptionists, teams that include nutritionists, teams that include community health workers, teams that include pharmacists. And the whole thinking is that you want everyone on the team to practice to the top of their profession. So if there's something that that physician can delegate because there's only a limited amount of time in that appointment, another staff member can do it. It could be patient education if you have a, a patient who wants to stop smoking. Perhaps that responsibility to do that smoking cessation education is better handled by a nurse or a medical assistant. And when the medical assistant and the physician are working together and communicating and thinking about the patient as a whole, that's when team-based care really starts to come together. Now this isn't easy. There is something called the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative in Massachusetts. And they were helping practices move from the traditional way of primary, um, providing patient care to this new augmented, rede augmented redesigned primary care. And one of the things that they found that time and time again, when they were helping practices, this was actually the toughest thing to do, was to help people work together differently, to reassign roles and responsibilities, and focus as a team instead of individuals. And that's where the Healthcare Workforce Transformation Fund comes in, the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA at the federal level, also is helpful in this area. Um, but again, this is a, um, an incredibly important, but also a challenging area. All right, care coordination. We talked about this, but this is the third skill I wanna touch on. So as the different, different kinds of providers are coming together and they're forming new entities, there is enhanced incentive to talk to one another, to share information, to communicate, think about the whole person. And that's through care coordination. And it can mean a lot of things. It can mean um, linking primary care to behavioral health care, linking primary care to specialty care, linking primary care to pharmacy care. It can mean when folks are discharged from the emergency department or the hospital, making sure that the tra transition back to the community goes smoothly. It can mean linking folks to community-based resources and supports. So it can, mean, it can mean a lot of things. And the last skill I want to touch on is proficiency in health information technology. And this is absolutely exploding, evolving incredibly quickly, um, and is so important. You hear um, a lot of different concepts in this area. One of them, with these new models, is called data for population management. So if, if I think about um, a medical record, for instance, there's gonna be some demographic data, right? There's gonna be age, gender, race, ethnicity. There's gonna be some clinical data in a medical record. You've got your blood pressure, you've got whether or not you use tobacco, maybe the um, prescriptions that you use. There's gonna be some health assessment data. 
When was the last time a person had their preventive health screening? Um, do they have behavioral health needs? What's their medical history? And data for population management is basically using this data to learn, to make change, and to promote better health and reduce costs. So for instance, you might run a query out of all of your electronic medical records, and you might pull all of the folks who haven't been in your primary care practice for a whole year and need a well visit. You might pull those, and then you might reach out to them and try to come back in, with your, back in your walls to make sure that they're getting the primary and preventive care they need. You might pull everybody who's overdue for a medication refill. You might pull everybody who's due for a mammogram or a colonoscopy. And then you do targeted outreach to these groups of patients to promote better health. That's, that's actually leveraging and using your data for population management. There's also a term that's used a lot called meaningful use. And meaningful use essentially means three things. It's not just that you have the data, but again, that you're really leveraging it. The first way you can leverage it is for actual medical care. An example of that is e-prescribing. Another way you can leverage it is you can share it between healthcare institutions to coordinate care and to promote good communication. And the third way you can leverage it is you can use it for learning and evaluation. You can pull the data and see how you're doing compared to different benchmarks, where you're doing well, where there are gaps, where you need to improve, how different kinds of innovations or experiments that you're doing in your practice are shaping up. So it's, there's a, a high demand for a workforce that not only understands how to, to input this data, but how to really use it. Okay. Now I'm gonna talk about three professions because these professions were impacted by the chapter 224, the cost containment law, and have implications for, for these professions and the broader workforce. The first is nurse practitioners. We have a lot of nurse practitioners in Massachusetts. We have 103 nurse practitioners per 100,000 population. In the US, there's only 58. So there's a lot of nurse practitioners here. Chapter 224 expanded what nurse practitioners can do. It gave them something called global signature authority. An example of, of that is a, um, it's a law or rule that used to require a signature of stamp of a doctor. Now a nurse can do that. A great example is workers' comp cases. So now nurses can do some things that before doctors could only do. And, and, and workers' comp cases are an example. Something I think that's also fascinating is Chapter 224 expanded the use of limited service clinics. So whoever's heard of a minute clinic at a CVS or a Walgreens, right? So we've all heard of them. Right now in the regulations in Massachusetts, the services that can be provided there are pretty narrow. You can, you, know, you can get your flu shot, you can get a, a, a test for strep throat, but it's, it's fairly narrow services. Chapter 224 changes this and says that at limited service clinics will be able to provide any service that's within the scope of practice for a nurse practitioner. Well, nurse practitioners can diagnose, they can treat, they can manage acute and chronic disease, and they can also provide wellness and prevention. So that's an explosion the kinds of services that will be able to be available at these minute clinics. And I think that has implications both for nurse practitioners and healthcare in general. Okay, let's talk quickly about physician's assistants. Our state similarly has a lot of physician's assistants. A uh, physician assistant has to be supervised by a physician. Before, one doctor could only supervise four PAs. Now they can supervise as many as they want. It's unlimited. But the bigger deal is Physician assistant is now included in the definition of a primary care provider. So for me, for instance, when I have um, my health plan, I had to select a primary care provider. And I had a list of doctors and nurse practitioners that I could pick from. This law requires physician assistants to now be added to that list. So it really elevates the profession of physician assistants. And finally, the last uh, kind of occupation I'd like to talk about is a community health worker. And this is something we talked about before too. These are folks who are hired primarily for their understanding of the unique culture and language in the communities that they work and live. And they can do, they can do all sorts of things. They can do health education, they can do outreach, they can do connections to social support, they can do counseling. And 
Starting in 2012, a board of certification of community health workers was established. And this is a big deal because for the first time ever, it attempts to standardize and elevate this profession. So they're developing um, um, standardized training curriculum for community health workers and a certification program for community health workers. And this has big implications. Community health workers aren't typically paid for under the fee-for-service system. But if you remember way back from about a half an hour ago, the One Care program in Massachusetts, that does pay for community health workers. And now healthcare, community health workers are gonna be certified. So if you're a healthcare employer, you know what you're getting if you're getting a community health worker because you know the education and the program that they've gone through. So community health workers are absolutely something to watch too. So now that we've been through transformations in the healthcare workforce, let's talk quickly about some funding streams that are out there to help make this all happen. Nancy and Karen already talked about the Healthcare Workforce Transformation Fund, which I think is one of the most exciting. And it's gonna help provide opportunities for training so that the healthcare workforce can really respond to all of these demands that are ha happening under the Federal Affordable Care Act and Chapter 224. The other kind of grant, HPC is a Health Policy Commission chart grants. These, this is, used to be called the Distressed Hospital Fund. So to make this local, in this area, qualifying hospitals might include Addison Gilbert, Beverly Hospital, Melrose Wakefield, and Winchester Hospital. And grants go to these hospitals to help them adopt health information technology, to help them transition in payment form, to help them become certified as accountable care organizations, and generally to improve quality and affordability of care. The eHealth Institute Fund is also interesting. That's, that's um, very powerful for organizations that are looking to um, en enhance their use of their electronic data, really move along that meaningful use continuum. Um, and there's incentives with the Medicare and the Medicaid program, so there are dollars there. And there's also something called the Massachusetts, in, um, Massachusetts Health Information Highway that is developing an infrastructure where different providers will be able to talk to each other um, regardless of provider affiliation, type of provider, or um, their electronic capability. And this group helps organizations, again, that are looking to enhance their connectivity, um, um, increase their adoption, and develop their, um, their integration services. So if, if that is your organization, they are definitely a, um, a fantastic resource to connect with. The Prevention and Wellness Trust dollars are already out. Um, nine grants were awarded in January. Um, the closest grant to this area was um, awarded to the City of Lynn. Um, so they're doing excellent work to reduce costs and um, in enhance health promotion and disease prevention in the City of Lynn. And finally, the innovation grants are, are on hold. They're, um, they're interesting. Um, they are, their purpose is to foster, again, innovation and in payment and delivery, but they're tied to casino licenses. And as we know, that's incredibly controversial and up in the air. So those grants, um, they're, they're on, on hold for now. So as you can see, the implications of changes in healthcare payment and changes in healthcare delivery have incredible implications for the workforce. And it's exciting because this is so new and it's changing so quickly that you all will have an incredible role in shaping that. And there's no right or wrong answers. It's gonna take an incredible amount of hard work, creativity, learning, trial and error, to really move along this continuum of reducing costs and improving quality. But just because it's not easy, it doesn't mean it's a, a challenge that's not worth taking on. And I applaud you for being all here this morning, and um, the foundation looks forward to working with you as partners in the journey to increase quality and reduce costs. Thank you. And we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Sure, I'm not an expert in motivational interviewing, but I can I can tell you 
um, generally what it means. And um, my, my husband is actually a healthcare practitioner, so this is more drawing from dinner table conversation than knowledge at the foundation, to be totally honest. So my understanding, and if people have more experience in the audience, I, I definitely please jump in. But my, my understanding of motivational interviewing is it's, it's how you get someone to go from where they are to a state of change, okay? So it's first, it's, it's meeting someone where they're at and understanding what their goals are and in their life what the barriers are and the opportunities. And, and it's, it's then taking the next step, and this is where kind of you start to get into coaching, is helping figure out, okay, how can you overcome these barriers and, and how can they begin to make changes? And it might not all happen overnight, but what are kind of the nearer term wins or goals that you can do with the, with the ultimate goal in mind? But it's, 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 it's a shift in thinking because it's no longer about the provider and what they see as the immediate goal for the patient. It's working with the, the patient, which is the partnership. And if you're not responding to what's most important for the patient, you're not gonna get very far with everything else. So it's, 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 it's a core tenant of patient-centered care. So that's, that's the way I think about motivational interviewing. That's certainly not a textbook definition, it's just kind of a general concept. Yeah. Hi, yep, one and two. You can ask as many as you want. Great question, and the foundation actually does have some data in that area. Um, most patients, most people in Massachusetts, um, upwards of close to 90%, report already having a usual source of care. Um, the, the tricky thing, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to get an appointment if you're a new patient, um, depending upon the geography where you live in the state, could be urban versus rural, and it also sometimes is a little bit different, or more or less difficult, depending upon the kind of insurance you have. With private insurance being a little bit easier than if you have public insurance. Um, so it depends. There also have been studies about um, quality of care between docs and nurse practitioners, and there, the, the results from these studies show that there isn't so much of a difference. And patient satisfaction with folks who do have nurse practitioners or other providers um, also tends to be very high. So, um, so it, it, the answer to your question is honestly, it depends. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. fantastic concern and and that feeling of getting bumped out isn't specific to social workers they I think nurse practitioners and physician assistants or nurses medical assistants would say the same about who are these community health workers we've been doing a good job for years it's not meant to um, to take away from any other profession community health workers they, they some of the largest value that they add is um, is serving as a bridge between patients who of, often experience very intense linguistic and cultural barriers and the actual health system. 
and they're not appropriate in all settings. So a way that a community health worker and a social worker might work together is um, in an underserved community where there's some pretty significant behavioral health needs. There might be a lot of stigma associated with behavioral health. So the community health worker might go out and do some community education and get them in the door to see you as a social worker. So that. Okay. Yeah. social work. It doesn't take away from social work. It, it adds, um, and I guess I'm not personally, um, the, the, the concept is that um, there isn't going to erase a need for any existing health professional. Um, that nurses and doctors and medical assistants and social workers all still have an incredibly valuable place in the healthcare system. And, there, and what's happening is that community health workers already exist, and they don't always go by that name. Sometimes they're promotoras, as you said, sometimes they're patient navigators. They estimate that there's roughly 3,000 of them in Massachusetts anyway. And, and so it's the challenge is, right, exactly what you're saying, is if you have a whole team of folks, and if there's a social worker on the team, first you have to figure out, well, gosh, is there a need to have a community health worker? Right? Maybe there isn't, and, th and then, then it's not appropriate. But in some cases, if, if, the, if the, the barriers in the community are significant enough and the social worker on the team doesn't have time to do the outreach and the counseling, maybe it would be okay to have that promotora make the linkage, but it's, but it's all, um, you have to figure it out for that specific situation. And I think the certification because they're called 10,000 different things, right? If everyone had a common, a common name for them and a common understanding of what they do and don't do, you'll be able to beg better figure out if they fit into your teams or not. So, great. So thank you everybody with that. We're I know I learned a lot, sat there mesmerized by all this new information. Hi everyone, my name is Pat Gentilly and I'm the president at North Shore Community College and we're just delighted to be a partner in this workshop this morning. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing some um, expert leaders who will now respond to what we've heard and talk a little bit about um, their insights into implementing this on the ground. But first, I also want to recognize that Darren Swim from Congressman John Tierney's office has joined us. Darren, here you are. Thank you very much for coming. So let's talk first about Bob Norton. As President and Chief Executive Officer of North Shore Medical Center, Bob Norton is responsible for the strategic leadership, operational oversight, and network development activities of the second largest community hospital system in Massachusetts. He leads more than 4,500 employees and manages a budget of more than 500 million across multiple campuses and satellite locations. Since arriving in 2002, Mr. Norton has expanded clinical collaborations between North Shore Medical Center and Massachusetts General Hospital, overseen recent Salem campus renovations supported by the largest philanthropic initiatives in the medical center's history and led the implementation of patient safety technology that places North Shore Medical Center among the vanguard of community hospitals nationwide. Prior to joining North Shore Medical Center and Partners Healthcare, Bob Norton served as president and CEO of Shands Jacksonville Medical Center in Florida, 
Prior to that, he was executive vice president of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Previously, he held the most senior positions at New England Deaconess Hospital and New England Baptist Hospital and served in a range of executive roles with Rhode Island Hospital in Providence. Mr. Norton graduated from the University of Rhode Island with a degree in biomedical engineering and received his master's degree in healthcare administration from the University of Minnesota. So I'm looking very much to hearing what he has to say. Next to him is Dennis Conroy. Dennis was appointed Chief Executive Officer of Addison, Gilbert, and Beverly Hospitals in December 2012, following the affiliation between Northeast Health Systems and Leahy Clinic. The parent organization, Leahy Health, brings together not only award-winning hospitals and nationally recognized physicians, but also a network of senior care services that offer a broad range of at-home services, skilled nursing and rehabilitation services, and assisted living facility and community-based adult day health programs, as well as one of the area's most comprehensive behavioral health networks, providing integrated inpatient and outpatient services throughout Northeastern Massachusetts. Prior to this appointment, Mr. Conroy served as Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Northeast Health System. In this position, he was responsible for the financial operation of Northeast Health Systems, a $450 million operation with acute care, behavioral health, and senior services provided in a variety of inpatient, residential, and outpatient settings. Before this, Mr. Conroy was a partner in the Boston office of Ernst & Young, where he spent 30 years primarily serving the healthcare industry. Mr. Conroy, Mr. Conroy is a certified public accountant and holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree in business administration from Boston University. So as you can see, these are two terrific experts and leaders in the field, and so I'm just gonna turn it right over to Bob first to comment for a bit on what he's heard and what he's been seeing. Thank you, Pat. Uh, the first note that I made this morning was to uh, shorten that thing that we always give people to introduce <laughs> you because we just wasted five minutes of your time uh, learning about Dennis and I. Um, I thought what I would do is just, uh, I think Jessica did a great job in commenting on a very complicated um, transition that's going on in healthcare in the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts and in the country. And I thought what I would do is just share a couple of thoughts about um, the uh, reform part of this and uh, the road to reform. Uh, maybe have Dennis do the same, then we'll come back and talk a little bit about what us the institutions are doing in that process. So um, first of all, I'd say uh, Jessica was exactly right, and you all have known this uh, for a while now around uh, why reform is so important. So if you've all seen uh, the many uh, slides that uh, are at various uh, conferences around the growth in the expenditures of healthcare, um, the uh, favorite one shows uh, gross do domestic product and the amount that uh, healthcare eats of the gross domestic product. The latest one I've seen says it will be 30% by 2050. Um, that can't be, needless to say, or else we won't be doing a lot of the other things that we need to do. The other one that I think uh, Jessica's comment on her on earlier as well is this concept of how much we spend as an organized country uh, versus some of the countries in Europe and the return on that investment, if you will, and it's clear that we spend more than other countries do, in many cases, uh, two to three times more than other countries do. When you looked at uh, the indicators of, indicators of health, uh, the return just doesn't seem to be there. The one that I find the most striking that I think is probably the most relevant for each of us in this room is if you looked at the uh, expenditures of, of the state of Massachusetts and go back to uh, about the year 2000 to today, and you look at uh, the expenditures of the state by category and what's grown in uh, those various categories and what's uh, contracted, the, uh, the only single line in the state uh, expenditures that has grown during that, uh, what now, 14 year period is healthcare. And it's grown by an alarming 60%. So the state's spending 60% more today than it did in 2000. The average uh, decrease in the rest of the uh, nurses expenditures in the state has been something between 10 and 15 percent. We're now spending twice what we spend, uh, uh, twice on healthcare in Massachusetts that we spend on education. So um, 
we, and I say we as all of us, not just Dennis and I, uh, are responsible for the decisions that lead up to that. The reason I say all of us uh, is uh, what happens sometimes in the simplistic thinking about this problem is um, we spend too much on health care. Since you two guys spend all the money, you should solve the problem and tell us how you're going to solve the problem. I wish it were that easy. Um, it's not even close to being that easy. Um, the, uh, the way in which we deliver health care in this country is a combination of uh, public policy and the way in which we as individual citizens are willing to invent public policy around this. It's a combination of the way it's paid, as I think Jessica pointed out very eloquently earlier, and then the way the healthcare system is delivered. I'll, s I'll give you just three examples uh, in small fashion around the public policy decisions that we make in this country and its in impact on the way in which we deliver healthcare. Uh, one of them is very local. In Massachusetts today, the expenditure or the utilization of uh, emergency department services is um, uh, highly inappropriate, I guess, just to use a word. Way too many people use uh, emergency departments to get uh, primary care when they should. Um, if you look at the way the state Medicaid system pays for the utilization of healthcare services, an individual covered by Medicaid can go to an emergency department for free. If they go to their physician's office, they pay something on the order of uh, $25 copay. Um, that sounds like a little thing, and you'd say, well, it's $25. When you look at that as a public policy decision, it influences the way people choose to get the care, and it's something that we as a state have to address. Um, a similar one, when you think about um, the way in which uh, the uh, public policy decisions get laid out, is uh, these accountable care organizations that Jessica mentioned a minute ago. The accountable care organizations uh, were formed as a part of the uh, Federal Accountable Care Act, and uh, they are organized, as Jessica pointed out, to be groups of doctors in hospitals who then take complete responsibility for organizing and delivering the care to that population. Since we as a country were, and still are, loath to tell all of us where we can go to get our care, we have patients in uh, Partners ACO now, and Jessica mentioned that we have one of their largest ACOs, um, who we are now economically responsible and clinically responsible for delivering that care. But they are, because we value choice so much in this country, they're free to go get their care anywhere they choose. Mm -hmm. So we're responsible for paying for it. We're allegedly responsible for providing it. But if they choose to go to Dennis's system and get that care, that's within their free choice. And we have to pay the bill back to Dennis, which seems silly. It'd be like somebody going to Salem State and deciding they wanted to go to Harvard to take their lectures, and uh, Pat would have to pay the bill. Um, maybe an interesting analogy. Um, but the last one that I would uh, mention is when the Accountable Care Organization was formed, and this goes back to the roots of Medicare as well, there is a uh, limitation in the federal legislation that says the United States government is forbidden from negotiating with drug companies to buy drugs at the lowest rate. The United States government is the biggest purchaser of drugs in the entire world, and they're forbidden by legislation to negotiate prices. Um, that's crazy, uh, to use a technical word. Um, those are public policy decisions that we have to be willing, as a citizenry, to deal with as a part of this um, uh, reorganization of the way we deliver care. I'll let Dennis comment on some of that, too, and then I'll come back to some of the things we're doing to try to address the change in the way the delivery system is uh, yeah, just a couple of comments, Bob. Um, uh, Bob's observation about the uh, Medicare Accountable Care Organizations is, is right on. The, uh, the interesting things, I think the commercial insurers have ACOs right. I mean, Blue Cross did a good job where if, 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 you, can, uh, if you manage the care appropriately working with the patient, uh, the patient, the insurance company, and the provider uh, can, can win. Uh, but the, the limitations around who's in your accountable care organization and how much you can, uh, you can manage their care, uh, you know, is, is, is just, it, it defeats the whole purpose of, of trying to have this kind of an arrangement. Uh, Bob talked about the location of care, but also the frequency of care. If you're in a commercial product, you, you, you have to get some kind of uh, authorization from the primary care physician. If you're in the, the Medicare accountable care organization, 
you can decide today you want to go to a doctor and tomorrow you want to go to a doctor and as Bob said, he's responsible for it. So it's, it, it, that's really a challenge. Another, another factor that, that increases the cost in Massachusetts uh, is you know, one, of the, one of the strengths of the healthcare system in Massachusetts is the number of academic medical centers. It's also one of the, the factors that drives the cost of, of care statewide. And I, I, I'm sure I'm gonna butcher this statistic, but it, it's something like 40% of the care provided in Massachusetts is provided at academic medical centers. In most other urban areas, uh, New York, Philadelphia, DC, Chicago, it's like 15%. So they're wonderful institutions, but they're expensive institutions. And, and so how we wrestle with that problem will also affect how we uh, um, you know, can, de can deal with the healthcare costs uh, situation. Um, one other thing about Jessica's uh, summary, and, and, and again, I think she did a terrific high level uh, picture of, of, this, of the situation, is, is where we are in that continuum. Jessica mentioned where we, we lived in a fee-for-service world where you got paid by each. You know, for every unit of service you provided, you got a little payment. And we're looking forward to that period where we're in a budget-based or some kind of uh, global uh, payment arrangement. Well, unfortunately, and, and I think she asked, you know, what percentage of, or mentioned what percentage of people, it's like 14%. Uh, and so even if you had Medicare on top of it, let's say it's 50%. So half of, half of a hospital's revenue is dependent upon an old system where your incentives are clearly to provide you know, the number of, of, of pieces of service, and the other half of your revenue is dependent upon not providing those, uh, those kind of things. So you're, you're in a schizophrenic world, and you're doing it in a, in a place where the margins aren't very high. I mean, our operating margin target is usually around 1%, and a 1% margin doesn't give you a lot of room for error. Uh, and so, you know, trying to balance those type of things make, make the, uh, uh, the, the details of what sounds pretty good from an academic perspective uh, a little messier on the ground. So maybe if it's okay with you, I'll go back to just a few of the things that we're doing. I'm sure Dennis uh, can uh, highlight some of what uh, his system is doing as well, because uh, largely this movement in the direction of um, systems taking more of an accountable role for providing care in a more organized way is definitely the right direction to go. So uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, partners at the North Shore Medical Center uh, was one of the early, they called pioneer ACOs. Um, we have uh, 75,000 lives and partners now that we are uh, responsible for under the Medicare ACO program. About 15,000 of those are located on the North Shore. What we've tried to do um, and as the major effort inside this ACO infrastructure now, um, in addition to using the patient-centered medical home technique that, um, again, Jessica could talk about, I'll come back to that in a minute, but is to identify the patients in that population that have the highest needs for uh, let's say most aggressive intervention. So we have about 10% of our patients in the accountable care organization now that are in what we call the integrated care management program. Each one of those individuals, and they are people with, you know, things like congestive heart failure and diabetes and on and on and on, the uh, more chronic diseases that history has shown consume the most uh, resources. Um, the old 80-20 rule uh, works in healthcare and that is 20% uh, of the people uh, consuming health care are accountable for 80% of the expenditures. So uh, we've taken this 10% uh, of the sickest patients and put them into this uh, ICMP program. We always have to invent a new acronym so you'll never understand what we're talking about. We do that <laughs> regularly. Um, so we have another new one. Uh, each of these individual patients has a care manager assigned to them that is a part of the patients at a medical home. Um, this is a new role that uh, we've invented, if you will, and therefore something that I think does have implications for training and education down the road as well. But each of these care managers has a patient panel of about uh, 20, 200 patients, and they're responsible for essentially at a bottom line keeping those patients healthy. So they're doing things like weekly outreach to say, um, you know, are you keeping your diabetes in check? Are you keeping your congestive heart failure in check? We have electronic ways to keep connected with them that are very interesting these days where um, we have scales in patients' homes that are connected directly to uh, those uh, systems in the physician's office 
when, when they weigh themselves in the morning, we know whether their congestive heart failure is um, uh, going the wrong direction. Um, so uh, that program has served to be uh, incredibly popular, both with the patients that, as you might imagine, are getting this extra level of attention and coordination that they've never gotten in the past, and secondly, with the providers who are very happy to have a colleague now helping them manage these very complex patients that they've managed before um, on their own. Jessica mentioned something very important a minute ago. This is all so new that we don't know whether all the money that we're spending on providing this extra care is actually going to result in lower care. I will say that the early data from the Partners um, uh, Pioneer um, organization is promising, but the data showed something on the order of about 3% savings after you've added the new cost of the infrastructure that I just mentioned. Across the country, the early data looking at the ACO performance um, is actually mixed. Uh, some of the ACOs actually uh, provided lower cost care in this new structure. Some of them provided higher cost care. Um, so I'm not sure the um, uh, jury's in yet in terms of whether it will overall be effective. Uh, somebody smarter than me, though, said uh, in an early uh, session when I was in a few weeks ago, um, we don't know yet whether it's going to be effective, but we don't have a plan B either. So we're going to try this as best we can and try to make it work because it's an important way. The second thing I just commented on is this investment, again, in population health management. Um, we're very actively on this track now, as I think Dennis's system is as well. Um, each of our primary care offices now is in this transition to become uh, patients at a medical home. Uh, in that regard, the um, actual team that's now present in the primary care office is uh, consists of both primary care physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, care managers, uh, in some cases pharmacists. Uh, the latest that we've added are mental health workers as well because many of our patients, of course, have uh, comorbidities and mental illness in addition to their physical illness uh, mm -hmm. issues. Um, again, I think the care that we're delivering in those offices is much, much better today than it was just a few short years ago under this new patient-centered medical home. Um, Partners overall is spending about $65 million this year to make that happen. Um, whether or not at the end of that we can reduce hospital utilization, keep these people healthy or not, I think, again, uh, the jury's still out in that regard. So Dennis, I'll turn it back to you, Frank. Just a couple of overall comments. I don't want to repeat what Jessica and, and Bob have already mentioned, but I mean, we consider ourselves as a hospital in the knowledge business, getting the correct diagnosis, uh, you know, providing the correct uh, treatment is, is our goal, uh, and, it, and it certainly requires knowledge. Uh, fortunately, we do it pretty well, as, as do most of the hospitals in Massachusetts. It's, it's remarkable, the uh, high quality of care provided across the Commonwealth. Now, in providing that care, we, we certainly rely on machines and technology, but it, it, it also requires us to have an educated and, and experienced workforce. Uh, and, and even when we rely on the technology, the technology is always changing and, and, and there are advances. So if we want to be in the knowledge business, we also need to be in the learning business. Uh, and uh, you know, so we're see we seek as our employees, you know, folks who are committed lifelong uh, learners. Um, we're, we're also in the efficiency business. I, I talked about our 1% margin and, and Jessica talked about the, the presentation, uh, in our presentation. We really don't have the, the, uh, the ability, the capacity, to carry uh, people with, with last year's skills who are unwilling to learn. Uh, and then we also have to control turnover uh, because certainly in our place, uh, at, at any hospital, uh, to be able to be, um, to touch a patient, you know, there's a, there's a, a great uh, a training program that, that folks go through before they even start. So you know we, we have to maintain turnover uh, at a at a reasonable level. So we have to pr be providing a, an environment that is attractive to the, uh, to the workforce. Um, you'll you heard and, and and Jessica mentioned working what we call working at the top of their license. You know where someone is doing everything that they're uh, able to do. That's usually very fulfilling for people, uh, and it and it is an attraction. So what we want to make sure is that they're prepared. Uh, to work at the uh, at the top of their license. Fortunately, healthcare attracts a workforce that is, you know, generally wants to learn, wants to advance, and in, on top of that is is uh, talented and, and dedicated. And m many, I'd say, a high per 
very high percentage of our, our workforce has been in healthcare for all or, or most of their career. And, and they, they typically come to us with a, or, or develop with us a patchwork of skills that really make them very valuable. I mean, a good example is some of our clinicians who have become IT specialists. I mean, they just uh, you know, make the, the, the place sing uh, by, uh, by the, the, that uh, combination of, of, uh, of skills. Fortunately, we're also in an environment uh, on the North Shore uh, you know, to help us address these needs to keep our, our workforce uh, up to date and, and knowledgeable and trained. I mean, Salem State, Endicott College, uh, the community college at North Shore, uh, Gordon, and, and, and then, you know, if we go outside the region, we also have some opportunities there as well. So, you know, it, a lot of those things are coming together. You know, uh, Jessica mentioned some of those specific targets, case managers, NPs, PAs, uh, practice managers for, uh, for physician offices, IT, and particularly with clinical skills, coders, uh, and even, even the ones that, even this, the, uh, the, the, the uh, job classifications that you say, well, geez, it's, it's not really uh, in vogue right now, nurses, you know, that we have a, a bit of a nurse surplus. Well, we also have an aging nurse workforce uh, that, and I think some of the kids who now uh, are not putting their nursing degree to the, you know, in use as much as they would like, are going to have some terrific opportunities in, in the next couple of years. So I think as an industry, there are going to be tremendous opportunities uh, and, you know, tremendous responsibilities on our part, you know, to, uh, uh, to prepare our, our workforce and keep, and keep them up to date. It's imperative for us, and, and our biggest challenge is to look ahead and see who we're going to need three years from now. So we can work with Salem State or work with other uh, uh, the community college to to uh, to make sure that as people are coming out of the training or or programs are being developed, it's what we need then rather than what we needed last year. So that that's when I talk to our HR folks, you know that that seems to be you know the area we want to spend the most time on. Fortunately, we have good collaborative partners. You know, sometimes we've made a misstep. Step, sometimes it, it's cost them. But they've, uh, they've been uh, very helpful in, in making sure that we stay attuned uh, to, the, to our future needs. I might just wrap up with uh, one quick comment here. Uh, Jessica mentioned a number of uh, professions that she thought uh, with the new uh, world of the um, um, payment reform, health reform, uh, would be enhanced. I think there are also skill sets that every profession in healthcare is going to need to think about in a new way here as we go forward. Um, the first thing I would mention is this whole concept of what I would call improvement science. Um, there's a science of how you need to take a complex flow of the way care is delivered or the way any product is delivered and be able to look at that uh, product and flow in an organized way to try to create a better way to produce that care or produce that product. Um, we've had the uh, incredible fortune of working with a group that's uh, studied the Toyota production system and how Toyota produces a perfect car every 26 seconds. Um, we take your name five times when you come in for ambulatory surgery in the morning and ask it five times to make sure we got it right. Um, that's not the way Toyota builds a car. So improvement science, I think, is a skill set that every one of our professionals is going to need. The second one that I think is critically important, and I know there's some early thinking about this here at Salem State, is this idea about um, interprofessional education. It used to be in the old world that doctors could function as doctors and nurses could function as nurses and on and on and on. Um, this has become a team sport from what used to be an individual sport. And I think we don't teach team skills as much as we need to to be able to have our professionals interact in a more positive way. Um, I'd offer all of you one uh, article about that that if you haven't read it, it's very revealing, very entertaining as well. In 2011, Atul Gawande, uh, whom many of you may know is a physician for Brigham and a uh, writer for the New Yorker, gave the commencement address at uh, the medical school at Harvard. And the um, uh, title of his address was uh, From Cowboys to Pit Crews. And the basic premise was uh, cowboys used to work all alone on the range uh, herding cattle. And back in the days of uh, the range and cowboys, that was a good thing to do. Um, these days, you need the skills of a NASCAR pit crew to work together, and you've all seen the way cars pull into the NASCAR pit uh, to uh, 
Anyway, you can get this on the New Yorker. It's a very uh, uh, insightful article, I think, about the way the science of medicine has changed and the way we need to change as healthcare workers to try to make that uh, transition. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, we're gonna open it up to questions now. We've got about five minutes, so take advantage of having these experts to ask your questions. Yes, back there. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think the answer is uh, there aren't any formal requirements because it's a new role that's been invented literally in the last couple of years. Many of the care managers that we have now working in these roles um, are highly skilled nurses who have had a specialty expertise in diabetes or congestive heart failure, whatever it turns out to be. Many of them are the case managers who used to work on placement at the hospital that have made a transition now to be playing this role in the office but we're essentially doing um, on-the-job training to kind of create this skill set as we go. And therefore, I think the implications for the educational system are pretty broad in that regard. Mary? I think there's going to be more uh, than less uh, uh, because, I mean, uh, there, there'll be a, a, a range of, of, uh, of skills and, and jobs in healthcare. I mean, one of the things that it, you can't do to any great extent is to ship it to Southeast Asia and have it come back. And, and uh, you know, as the population ages and, and our, our requirements for, you know, we're, we're most of us need to pay our last dollar to stay healthy for an extra day. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think there will be more. Uh, so I would encourage anyone uh, who en enjoys working with people, making a contribution to the community, those type of things, I think healthcare is a terrific field to be in. I, I'd add one other perspective, I think, and that is I, I think there is going to be more as well. I would agree with the direction of more versus less. I think maybe a corollary question is uh, what are the skill sets that people really need to think about? And I think we've created this caste system in healthcare and in many other industries as well, where we have nurses doing nursing and doctors doing doctoring and pharmacists doing pharmacy. Um, and I'll give you one quick example. We are trying to do a better job in all of our institutions now on what's called medication reconciliation. Um, another technical term we invented so you'd all be confused. It's basically making sure that when you come in on the, into the hospital or to the emergency room, we know every medication you're on and when you leave uh, the institution, uh, we put you uh, back on the right medications to make sure you uh, treat you appropriately. Um, I'll be very honest and frank here. Sometimes I'm too frank and hope there's no reporters in the room, but what the heck, right? Um, we don't do a very good job at that um, because patients don't know many times what uh, uh, medicines they're on. So they come in and say, I don't know, it's some little white pill, you know? Um, so uh, we've had a long discussion now about how that work should be done. And the immediate trap we fall into is, because it's a pill and a medication, it must be a pharmacist. So now you bring a pharmacist into an already complicated team to say, you've now got three or four people that have to coordinate together as opposed to two or three. And the coordination and the handoffs, et cetera, get more difficult. I, I don't know how to do this. We educate them, we'll know better. I think we have to go back, I always would say go back because it sounds uh, retrospective, right? But to broadening education as opposed to it being more siloed. And I don't know how to do that. You all do.
question back here? assistants in our primary care practices. The role they're playing today is radically different than the role that they played just a couple of short years ago. Um, they are actually now functioning as uh, essentially flow managers to keep the primary care physician what we call in flow so that they don't back up all the way through the day and end up with a, a stack of work to do at the end of the day. They're essentially the new practice managers for each of the individual docs and we have them paired up with a primary care physician and a uh, MA, uh, again, not doing take the patient's blood pressure and then let me know, but keep me going in terms of the flow of our patients together as a team, which is a much more rewarding job for an MA than it ever was. And by the way, the primary care physicians love it. They hated it on day one because they're used to the old world, but they love it today. Dennis, like to comment? And then we're no, I, I think that's, you know, as I mentioned, one of our biggest challenges is, is to look ahead, and, and that's a perfect example of, of uh, how we have to look ahead and look at things differently. Thank you. We're, we've run out of time, and it gives me great pleasure to thank both gentlemen. <laughs> and to introduce Mary Saris, who's going to come up and give some closing remarks, but let me say a few words about Mary. We all know her, but we may not know all of her background. Mary Saris is the Executive Director for the North Shore Workforce Investment Board. Board the WIB, which is one of 16 in the, state, in the state of Massachusetts, is charged with developing and supporting our workforce development system so that individuals and employers needing labor market services can access them quickly and successfully. Now, previous to this, Ms. Saris spent over 20 years in the workforce development and education reform arenas, managing very various public and private initiatives, including school to career, job training, professional and curriculum development projects, and public information campaigns. Prior to coming to the WIB, she was the executive director of the Lynn Business Education Foundation, which is a private nonprofit local education fund designed to be a vehicle for business involvement in the Lynn schools. Many of us know her and appreciate her leadership. Mary? Thank, thank you so much. And uh, I have the easy job of wrapping this all up somehow over the next two minutes. First of all, I, I want to thank Jessica and the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation for that amazing presentation that will, with your permission, be on our website shortly. And we want you all to Look at it at questions, thoughts. It is one of the most thought-provoking sessions I think I've been, uh, been in. So really appreciate it and have learned so much through what you've said. I also want to thank Bob and Dennis. Without you, we would have no health care on the North Shore. So <laughs> we really, really appreciate you, you coming and spending your time and helping us understand this much more complex environment right on the ground and what, you, what you're facing. Of course, thanks Salem State for hosting. 
and also Salem State and North Shore Community College for being part of this effort and also for being such premier preparers of our workforce in healthcare because they, it is, I think we sometimes underestimate the importance of our colleges and universities in that role. And uh, your staffs, your deans, your Marianne, it's your first name, right? And, and all of your, um, your professors are always ready to respond to the changes that are coming out. And, and we're gonna need that more and more, as you have said. So we appreciate that very much. Obviously, I'd like to thank Comcore and Nancy and Karen and Amanda for participating and supporting this project and also supporting all of the efforts that we do locally and helping us know and understand what we should be doing when we should be doing that. The um, healthcare industry is the largest industry from an employment perspective on the North Shore. I'm not sure if people realize that. Over well over 30,000 people on the North Shore work in healthcare. So to the WIB and to the career centers, to our career centers, it is a critical industry that we're always trying to better understand and support. What's particularly good about healthcare also is that it has a, a very defined career path, many career paths within it, so that people can start, start at the bottom and literally move to the top with more education and training. And not all industries have that. So it's definitely one that we see as vital and important to what we're doing as we try to um, bring people into careers that pay self-sustaining wages and also support this very large uh, industry in our area. You know, I asked the question if we're gonna have more or less healthcare workers over the next five to 10 years. And part of me believes, given our population, and Jessica, you mentioned that Massachusetts is old. Well, Essex County is really old <laughs> compared to Massachusetts. It's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, county in the area. So I do see the huge demand for the service just growing and growing, and glad to know that we have such great partners in our uh, healthcare providers, in our colleges, in our educational providers, in our co community organizations, that the Career Center and the WIB will rely on you more and more as we go about doing our business. So again, thank you so much for coming on this July 9th, right after the 4th of July holiday. Good to know so many people are working, and uh, we look forward to helping you out again in the future. Thank you.